Thank you very much for a really interesting talk, uh, very topical, mm -hmm. kind of sad, of course, you know, um, to see this that it's going on in so many places of the world and the kind of changes that, that, that you know, from tourism. Um, so, I mean, I could ask some things, but let's open to the, the floor. Any questions? We've got quite an interdisciplinary group here, yeah, I know, people from totally unrelated schools. I'm wondering, do they have um, written language so that their songs were completely oral traditions or passed down through like some written forms? Um, they don't have a written language, but there have been researchers that came to create dictionaries, so they actually have a Maori dictionary now, but it's not the language, it's just dictionary of the words. And documentation of songs, uh, the researchers that uh, I showed you, they use, they use their knowledge of IP, International Phonetic System, oh. and they use that to notate the... the, the I didn't know it. I didn't use it because we're not trained. I mean, early anthropologists were trained to do that. Mm. Uh, I just notated it using the sound that I, I knew. So in this case, that mm. since they don't have... Um, like, they themselves mm. don't use like, like written mm. forms to, uh, to encode their, their sound, so if it's a complete oral tradition, so then could we draw the conclusion that because they don't, so that's basically that's coming from because they don't use the song anymore, there's no point. Like, because the song seems to be very educational instead of just a song, it's like as passed down as a knowledge, mm -hmm. then because they don't need the knowledge anymore, so they give it up, they don't sing it anymore. But then prior to that, how stable were the song? Like, say, prior to 1900, mm -hmm. is there any archaeological evidence or something sort of like that, where like how stable the song would like stay like that for 20 years or 100 years or like if thousands of years? Yeah, um, I think oral traditions were not meant to be sort of uh, documented in a, in a form that uh, everyone would sing the same thing. So normally oral traditions is you sing based on uh, the environment that uh, sort of uh, inspired you. And there was no need to document it until uh, we felt that there was a need. <laughs> the ethnomusicologists came in and decided that, hey, these are great songs, we should document them. So it's the anthropologists and the ethnomusicologists that have actually been doing these works. And maybe in time to come, it, through education, maybe the Mahmari people themselves actually have to motivate themselves to actually do their own documentation, I think. You were talking about eco-performativity, I like that term. Uh, but were you seeing that as a form of resistance? That kind of new way of dressing, or the songs are taking on some new kind of connotations to protest what's going on, or is it more of like a commodification of identity for the tourism trade, or is it both at the same time? Um, I think it's more for commodification and to sort of uh, exude this uh, this identity of mangrove being mangrove and sea people. But I use the term eco performativity. It's my words, so I'm I'm trying not to put words into their mouth to. But I think that this could be channeled to show that they are actually talking about their love for the environment. Yeah. So it could be a some form of resistance if in future it is needed. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, I was really interested in the um, the, the lyrics to the, the recent song where um, uh, there's this sort of explicit statement of this is our tradition. Um, sort of explicit expression of identity and solidarity and so on. Um, I was wondering if, if you saw the word tradition or any statements of that kind in the like earlier uh, song collection from 1906. Uh, and then a related question, if, uh, I'm, I'm curious if the word tradition is like a, a word that is indigenous um, or if it's an imported word or if, because um, in, in terms of like fashion and dress, it seems like mm -hmm. uh, there is this exaggeration and sort of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's my question. I, mm -hmm. the part um, yeah, actually so. that's a very interesting question because the <coughs> tradition, we, I didn't see it in, in any of the early 1900 songs. So it means maybe they weren't threatened at that time. They were just, you know, creating songs that were about the animals. But this assertion of the idea that this is our tradition is actually came from Mazna and her group. 
they are quite uh, they are quite vocal about uh, wanting to keep their tradition, and it seems to be yeah stated in those songs. I didn't realize that. Thank you for raising that. Uh, uh, is there is is there information out here? Like I'm wondering how like uh like uh like specific of a case this is. Like is there a lot of like data out there on like different like indigenous people from different parts of the world having the same pattern of their like the topics in in their lyrics changing towards uh the sort of like protective like traditions or uh, talking about the commodifications of the culture. Um, recently, there have been quite. Uh, I just went to SEM, and there is actually a panel on ecomusicology. Mm -hmm. uh, there is uh, that the, about the rock music that was uh, somebody discussed about it. Actually, Re Re Rebecca Moore uh, discussed about this, and somebody else talked about the Native American culture uh, lost of their land and using songs to sort of talk about it. I think there's, this is a growing theme. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, I think it should be happening because of the environmental problems that are going on now. It may be kind of growing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was wondering if there's any data on who the tourists are, um, because you know we're, they're making all these aesthetic changes for the tourism industry. But I'm wondering if there's any if if there's any more specificity on. Like who they're they're trying to you know sell this to, uh, presumably. Um, there's like a certain aesthetics of the tourism industry. Mm. Uh, you mean the visitors who come to visit the? the sure. Mm. Yeah. Or is it just presumed that it's mm. tourists? Tor well, yeah. Like mm. is tourist a, mm. a like monolithic European or dominant oh. dominant right. majority I, ethnic group? Right. I don't know. Actually. Um, you know, uh, when I was in the village, it's really not specific. It's like every other people. They even have school kids come from Malaysia bringing buses into the, the village to discover about their own local traditions. Mm. Uh, even the local people are going there. Um, about international tourists, it's actually everywhere around the world, not specific. Mm. I guess it's where Malaysia directs its tourism to. Mm. Yeah, the countries that uh, Malaysia is actually focusing on tourism. Mm. Uh, I mean, some somebody could do a research on that actually. Uh. <coughs> um, I might have, have, there are lots of things I'd like to comment on or ask, but one I've also I've been working on, on Tibetan music and songs, but um, I've seen well, just what one song um, springs to mind. It's <coughs> sort of, it's not explicitly ecological, but it is ecological. It's a very strong protest against the Chinese government talking about the sort of disaster of the Tibetan plateau rather than... I mean, the Chinese government will typically portray the Tibetan plateau as absolutely beautiful, like a paradise on earth. All the Tibetans are very happy and so on and so forth. And this song just inverts everything. So there's this discourse of the landscape um, um, which has been inverted. It's, re it's really... I have a copy with English subtitles. But then that... that this discourse of the, the, you know, the beautiful Tibetan land is very different from if you look at... Um, old oral folk songs, the way they talk about the land is very different rather than here it is out there looking beautiful. People are sort of in it and it has mm -hmm. the whole old um, um, hierarchy of the cosmos with the sort of mythic beasts or, or, or um, Buddhist deities going sort of down from into um, more natural or, or real uh, um, flora and fauna. Mm -hmm. So that itself is a, mm -hmm. is a transformation. So it's, it's, uh, it's really interesting looking at these changes of, of lyrics and the way the natural world is, is spoken about and interacted with. I was wondering if you, um, um, have has there been any repatriation of, of those old songs, um, which were collected, what, 1909 or something? Cause, and they're really interesting, looking at in terms of today's ecological values, there are there, those three were all about killing animals, <laughs> it's quite, which is kind of, you know, the way people have, have lived and so on, but in terms of the sort of green movement. Um, but I'd be really interested if what, um, sorry, I'm jumping around a bit, but the, the people's reaction is if, to see their, their own old songs, which they're no longer... Um, oh, okay, this is, this is funny because, okay, let me address the first issue about mm -hmm. killing animals. So uh, Tyler asked me to join his Gibbon, Gibbon uh, 
I know, and it's all about saving the gibbon. So I come here with this song about how uh -huh. the indigenous people are actually <laughs> killing the gibbons for yeah. meat because gibbons were plentiful at that time mm. and the mummery were just like few people. Mm. So it, it's kind of interesting how, yeah, how people would frame the song compared to how people might frame the song today about, oh, we should talk about extinction and, you know. And the second thing that you talked about, about the people listening back to their yeah. own songs, the thing is there's no recording of the songs in 1906, no audio recording. So all we have is lyrics. And only in translation? Uh, uh, the Mamari language and also in English. Has anyone read them out to them in, um, in the Mamari language? So I actually uh, sent send the Siamang song to Masna and I asked her, hey, do you remember this song? Um, she looks at it and says, yeah, I remember some, the tune of the Mamari, uh, the Siamang song, but she doesn't relate to the lyrics mm -hmm. because that was not passed on to her from her father. There was maybe from some other groups and singing about some other themes. Because I think each family will have some of another version of mm. the Siamang song and which relates to them. So if I asked her, hey, can you compose a song based on these lyrics? I think it's weird for her to do that. Yes, I can imagine. Right? Yeah. yeah. And are there less songs now? Because the later studies in your study, there were sort of seven or yeah. So are there, are there just less or...? There are nine songs and I asked her... In, the, in this village? Uh, in this village. There Only are, nine songs? Uh, because they are, they, it's now songs is not, recreation, it's not for recreation anymore. Songs is for commodity. So they keep performing the same songs over and over again for commodity. It's not like, oh yeah, I have a song debate with you. I'm going to compose lyrics that I'm going to debate with you. Mm. So there's no dynamics in song mm. text com composition anymore. Mm. So when I asked Mazna, have you created any new song recently? Uh, she said no. Yeah. Mm. Interesting, yeah. Just jump, just jump onto that. So what do they listen to? Mm. So they just listen to international music now? Um, their kids all have cell phones. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they are regular festivals. It's like the band. Okay. Yeah. And how many are there in the of, of this of this group? Um, which you, this or mm -hmm. in general? Uh, only two thousand left yeah. recently. Tiny. Yeah, yeah, very very small. And are there uh, the government? Are they doing mm -hmm. anything? Are there any sort of heritage, intangible cultural heritage, or anything like that going on at all? Hmm. The government hasn't focused on intangible cultural heritage, but is focusing on uh, highlighting them as tourists mm -hmm. for tourism agendas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have a question. Um, has there been any dialogue between um, this group and other like indigenous solidarity groups around the world who are dealing with similar issues? Mm -hmm. um, I know, like, even in even in like South Asia, I think there's like like in Indonesia and other places like that, there's mm. similar movements happening. Mm. And I'm wondering if there's been any talk about um, like solidarity work between uh -huh. the the groups or um, like inter international organization. Um, um, Mazda um, meets a lot of international performing groups. Recently, she said the Canadian groups are coming and they, have, they are having a discussion. So actually, they are exposed to a lot of international performance through the arena of tourism. So I'm not sure whether they actually raise up this, this issue with the other performers themselves. But uh, I haven't heard of that yet. But they may be because they are exposed to so many other groups now. Mm -hmm. And the Orang Asi themselves have started to become more, more, more vocal because they have started to get together and they formed the organization to protest on uh, land issues, especially in the Kelantan areas where they are losing their lands based on deforestation. So there is a slow movement rising. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think even with, like, it seems like they're aware of the movement in Hawaii, mm -hmm. like the work that's been going on there, the fact that people have come around from around the world to mm -hmm. protect the land and to advocate for the land rights, yes. it could be that something similar yeah. could occur. Yeah, 
I don't know why because mm. there's so many things happening but they didn't seem to be aware of it actually I sent the video of the hula resistance to Masna recently mm. I said hey look these are what people are doing <laughs> oh. that is huge yeah global oh. indigeneity yeah yeah if this becomes a concern if the government actually implements the maritime city conversion Uh, uh, I understand that you you said that the children or the kids had smartphones now. Yeah. Do you think that there could be kind of like a like grassroots like reclaiming like not for commodity sake? Mm -hmm. Do you think that that uh, and especially for like the sake of like the eco performativity that could like uh, like go against like the the government's exploitation? Do you think that mm -hmm. uh, do you think that they could have the means to do that in the future? Um, they they have the means to do it, but at the moment it has not become so urgent that the kids are actually uh, going for it. And talking about cell phones, right? When I was there, uh, the, this kid he actually carved the wood carving and sold it for about two hundred USD, and he used the money to buy a cell phone. I was like, why are you using the money to buy a cell phone? Um, at that time when I was there. So, but to them, they just carved that wood and sold it and they just used all the money to buy a cell phone. Because they want, they like, they want to listen to music to it and they want to contact friends through it. What's the industry shift like? So for the younger generations of the Maori people, do they more eagerly to integrate into the Malaysian society, like say, go to Kuala Lumpur to for a job or do they are, they are still willing to stay in their village? Uh, many of them are actually traveling to the you know, Klang Valley has a lot of uh, jobs actually opportunities in the factories um, so a lot of them have actually gone out and but they still come home to their village to stay I don't know why although they have to travel like on motorbike for like miles across the Palmer plantation to work and some of them still actually drive, drive back I mean go back to their village to stay because they maybe there's a sense of solidarity and community in the village itself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, a mm -hmm. very different trend, like say, uh, in China, where there's other ethnicity groups, where um, the homogenization, basically all the other 55 mm -hmm. groups are sort of just now amalgams into the Han. Um. Yep. Mm -hmm. But in China, there's also the, the 55 groups, or the recognized groups, yeah. and they have their recognized language and culture, and in some ways support, though it's also very controlling. There's a lot of um, you know, stereotyping and so on of what is Tibetan dance. Um, so it's all been reformulated, but at the same time, it's not been eliminated. Whereas, I mean, with 2,000 people, it's just, you know, it's, it's small. And in today's world, I mean, that's making me think of this all the work on, there was all this work on globalization, I guess it was sort of 80s, 90s, everything's going to just sort of grey out into one. And then there was the no localization, globalization. And everybody creates the, you know, their unique um, versions of whatever in, in their e tiniest of places. But then at the same time, well, not really. I mean, the, 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 the disparity of power and resources is it just, it's just... Yeah, I think this disparity is actually happening because uh, the Masna actually told me that part of the people have already converted to Islam. And um, so they are not very united anymore. Mm. So there's just this family that is sort of holding strong to the tradition. The, their traditional religion will be... Uh, um, like, what's the traditional religion? Their folk religion? Well, they call it categorized as enemies. Um, yeah, they have their ancestral spirits. Those ancestral spirits are all the carvings, the wood carvings are all... They have a whole pantheon of ancestral spirits. Mm. How big the religion plays part like in their modern life? Like, in this now modern dialogue, where uh, it's different religions that now, you know, spread their influence into their village, how important they still believe in their, uh, their ancestral belief. Maybe that group still does it because every, every year they would have their ancestral day and they would actually perform and they still carry on the rituals. So they are part of that group that still continue these rituals. But we do not know how long they can continue and when the bigger, the bigger group will sort of uh, subsume them. Mm. That which, which is why these things are important. Yeah. These songs and these performances are important to the sustainability of this culture.
do, do they um, facilitate the tourism themselves or is the tourism um, I guess mm -hmm. facilitated by maybe the my impression was maybe the government but I'm not quite sure oh I have a whole uh, a, a whole <laughs> paper about the um, cultural offices or tourism offices who come and mm -hmm. tell them hey you should change your performance to this okay yeah, yeah there's a whole <laughs> paper on that mm -hmm. okay. yeah. That recording you played with the bowed instrument and the singing, did you make that recording or where was, was that released commercially on a CD? Ah, the recording? Yeah, oh, the gosh. one you played. Of the... I have these nine songs that I do not know where to publish. So you recorded that? Yes, uh, in wow. quite a professional way. Yeah, the I sound know, was yeah. sounded amazing, like a commercial recording. So. Yeah. yeah. So I'm still finding a way to, I don't know where to publish it. I think, yeah. It's a shame not to publish it at all. Yeah. Yeah. Because once what do the community think? What do they? Would they want it on YouTube or or yeah. on, or on a, they would? No, because I have issues with copyrights now. Because like uh, if I publish on Spotify or I publish it on, I talked to you yeah. about it before. <laughs> I came here to find the answer because if I, I wanted to publish it on CDBaby.com, mm. and uh, CDBaby.com says. Um, yeah, you can, we will pay you, but you, it's up to you to decide with the community how you want to split the, the, the funds, what we should gain. So I was thinking, well, what if I got, a, once, one year I got $10 for the song. How am I going to, I don't want to do this accounting management, that I have to split the funds to the Mary. So I'm still it finding... It complicated. Yeah. I mean, Anthony Seeger is the one who's done this exact thing with Suya people, right? I mean, I don't know if... Yeah. He said anybody could write to his email address when he was here. Uh, who, who is that? Anthony oh, Seeger. When he when he recorded an album during mm -hmm. his fieldwork, then he released it on Smithsonian Folkways mm -hmm. and kind of was bringing back the proceeds proceeds every year from that album. Yeah. And kind of figuring out how to make those decisions. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Anthony Seeger. Uh, yeah. 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 He had a fund, right? A fund, a fund, fund or something for that the money would go back to the people. Yeah. I think it'd be interesting to hear what his advice would be in that situation. Mm -hmm. And the copyrights of the song, I mean, I do have to file copyrights of the songs to the people too. And, yeah. Yeah. There's something I need to do when I go back. Mm -hmm. Any further last questions or comments? Yeah, I have a general question on this term, like, kind of to it. Um, how much of it, the performance activity is um, actually context-based? If there is a, a certain repertoire or a certain piece that is played in the function of um, environmental protest, let's say, or, or more interactive environmentally, is that, <coughs> that in that context, Eco-performativity, but in other contexts, not. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, if they are facing a problem, then it, it's called eco-performativity. Okay. But if it's not, then um, it could be staging authenticity or asserting identity. I guess it is in what context is true that the that performance is for. Thank you very much, Claire. Okay. That was wonderful. Thanks a lot. And thanks everyone for coming.